Every year, hundreds of people go missing inside of national parks and forests all over North America. Of those hundreds, every year, there's always a few that go missing under very strange circumstances. And one man, whose name is David Politis, who's a former police detective, has made it his mission to investigate these strange disappearances. We're talking about people that are in plain sight of other people that suddenly, in an instant, go missing, and there's absolutely no trace of them. It's like they've just vanished off the earth. In other cases, it's people that have gone missing and then are found in locations that are seemingly impossible to get to. And so these cases are explored under David Politis's Missing 411. He's written numerous books, created documentaries around it. And so today I'm gonna to focus on three of these Missing 411 cases that in my opinion are especially bizarre and worth a closer examination. If the Missing 411 phenomenon is something you wanna look into more closely, I would obviously tell you to go check out David Politis and his team. I have all their links in the description. But you can also just go to one of my playlists. It's just called Missing 411. And I put any episode that I do about Missing 411 in that playlist. And so far, this is the fourth. And if you are a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do on this channel. And I upload three to four, even five times every week. So if that's something that you're interested in, I would encourage you to gently mule kick the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of those awesome weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1999, Alan Atadero was staying in the Comanche Wilderness in Northern Colorado with his two kids. He had his daughter who was six years old, her name was Jocelyn, and his son, Jared, who was three at the time. They were staying at the Poudre River Resort, which Alan actually owned. He, he co-owned it with his identical twin brother. And Alan was up there to prepare the resort for winter. Alan had recently divorced from his wife and joined a Christian singles group. And somehow it came up that some people in the singles group asked if they could stay at the Poudre River Resort with Alan and help him prepare the resort for winter in exchange for free lodging so they could have a little vacation. Alan said that was great because he really needed the help. As soon as they got up there, 11 of the Christian Singles members were talking about going to the nearby state fish hatchery. Jared and Jocelyn had heard about this and were really eager to go with them. And they asked their father, Alan, if that would be okay. Alan felt comfortable with Jocelyn, his six-year-old going, but was reluctant to send Jared because he was three, was worried that you know he would lag behind and was just generally reluctant to send his youngest but Jared really wanted to go. And Jared was saying, well, you let Jocelyn go, I wanna go. Alan, maybe against his better judgment, said, yep, you can take you can take Jared. Jared hated wearing shoes. Jared said, can I leave my shoes? And Alan said, no, you gotta bring your shoes. And Jared really put up a fight. He didn't wanna wear his shoes. Alan said, okay, put on your shoes. We just won't tie them. That's the compromise they made. Put on his shoes, didn't tie them, and he was off. So the Christian singles group of 11 plus Jocelyn and Jared take off towards the state fish hatchery. But without asking for Alan's consent, instead of going to the state fish hatchery, they decided to head over to the Big South Trail, which was about 15 miles west of the resort where Alan was. They get to the beginning of this trail, which is an 11 mile, very rugged trail, A narrow path. It's fairly steep. You're going up almost 10,000 feet of elevation. This was a rugged hike. This was not a beginner's hike. Now, we don't know exactly what the timeline is here, but we know that Jared and Jocelyn were definitely with the Christian Singles group when they began this hike. Because at some point, the, the Christian Singles broke into like a fast group and a slow group. And during that time, when they kind of separated into two groups, Jared had somehow run ahead of one of the groups and had come in contact with these two fishermen that were on the, the Big South Trail. The Big South Trail was located near a world-class fly fishing area, and these two men were fly fishing. And they saw Jared, and they also saw these two groups of people making this, this climb on this trail, and they, the fishermen, assumed that he had to be with them. Jared walked up to them and said, hey, have you seen any bears in the area? And they said, no and Jared just skipped away. It's believed that the two fishermen that saw Jared on the trail were the last two people to see Jared alive. At some point shortly after Jared has made contact with these two fishermen, 
the singles group realizes they've lost track of Jared. They have Jocelyn, but they've lost sight of Jared. And so there's an immediate search of the area. They're yelling out to Jared. And after about an hour, they haven't found him. However, one of the Christian singles members hears a scream. It was not a scream of someone getting attacked, but rather it was way off, you know, off the trail. It sounded like a child who they would describe the scream as sounding gleeful, like they were playing with someone, like they were playing tag or hide and seek with someone. They tried to make it over to that area, but they couldn't locate where the sound was coming from. And despite yelling out for Jared constantly, they, they could never locate him. While the search is going on, one of the members leaves and goes back to the resort to break the news to Alan, Jared's father. Alan immediately gets in his car. He's yelling, you lost my baby. And he drives over to the Big South Trail. Now, Alan just assumed he'd be able to get out and just charge around like a maniac yelling for his son and he would find him. But he quickly realizes that this is a really rugged and very dense area. It's gonna be almost impossible for he alone to search and find his son. He calls authorities and authorities show up and they launch this massive search. Now the search and rescue crew, when they showed up, they were very confident that they were gonna find Jared. They felt like they had a really good sense of where he was, that it would have been very difficult for him to go anywhere. They had the fishermen saying they'd seen him. They had one of the members who heard a scream in a specific area. They've done these searches, unfortunately, many times, and most times they find the child hiding somewhere, crying somewhere, but they're unhurt. By the next day, after a full 24 hours of searching when they haven't found anything, that's when the search and rescue team began to realize that more than likely this was, this was not gonna be a successful search. Now, the search would go on for a week. It was a very chaotic search. The, the case had made national headlines, and so people were converging on this area in Colorado just to kind of be a witness to this case. You had, you had volunteers showing up left and right to help search, and police had to actually keep them from going into the area because they didn't want to clutter up the search area. So just very chaotic. And also during this time, a helicopter crashed that was searching for Jared. Luckily, no one, no one perished in that crash. But it was just this crazy search for about a week, and they don't find anything. A week after the search had begun, they officially called it off. And the going theory was that Jared had most likely been attacked by a mountain lion. Four years go by, and two hikers were in the same area on the Big South Trail, walking up the trail, and they decide when they got to this one section near where Jared went missing, there was this really steep, rocky climb that was not part of the trail. But if you wanted to, and you were adventurous and athletic enough, it's feasible that you could crawl up, you know, hands and knees all the way up this rocky face, and you could get to this rocky outcropping where you'd have this great view looking down over the canyon. And so these two hikers decide to do that. So they start climbing up this rocky slope that they would say is a treacherous climb. Uh, and actually David Politis, the, the man behind the Missing 411 Project, does a video where he climbs up that rocky face and it looks very steep and difficult to navigate. So these two hikers make it to this outcropping. And the first thing they notice is a pair of brand new children's sneakers, white sneakers. And as soon as they see it, they think, oh, I guess, I guess a family must be up here and they let their kid take their shoes off. And so they're looking around for like, you know, the family that must have just been adventurous and climbed up here, but there's no one up there and it's a small area. And they're like, huh? What are these shoes doing up here? Then they found bits of Jared's clothing near the shoes. His pants were found turned inside out, very completely turned inside out. His sweatshirt was more or less intact. Both the sweatshirt and the pants had all the signs of being out in the open for four years with you know weather hitting hard and being exposed to the elements. They were frayed and tattered. The shoes, had also apparently been out in the elements for four years, but showed almost no wear and tear. The hikers that found them literally thought they were brand new shoes. And then around that area, they also located one of Jared's teeth and they found a bone that belonged to Jared as well. So it really begs the question, how did Jared get up nearly 550 feet above the trail over extremely difficult to navigate terrain and why were his shoes completely unweathered after four years of being out in the elements? And why were his shoes up there in the first place? They were untied on his feet. He certainly would not have been able to navigate the terrain up there even with his shoes laced. But if he had been navigating that terrain, he almost certainly would have lost his shoes in the process. So we don't know what actually led to Jared's demise. However, we do know that somehow 
he was found, his remains were found in an area that was effectively inaccessible to him. In July of 1938, the Bilehearts family decided to go camping deep in the Rocky Mountains. Now, the Bilehearts family was a huge family. They had 10 kids, including Alfred, who was a four-year-old boy. One of the days they were camping, they decided to go on a hike to a great fishing spot. And so they got in this big line uh, with all 10 kids and the parents, and they start walking, and Alfred was far back in that line. And at some point he must have wandered off or got separated and at some point the family noticed there was an immediate preliminary search and there's a bunch of them they're calling out to their their son their brother after this initial search results in nothing one of the members of the family alerts authorities and it would launch a 10-day search when the authorities showed up they were operating under the assumption that alfred must have fallen into the river and drowned and so their efforts went into not only damming the river to stop anything going through, but they also began raking the river as well to find any of Alfred's remains. When the raking of the river and the damming of the river turned up nothing, the authorities decided to bring in some bloodhounds from a nearby state penitentiary to try to pick up his scent and find him. And so they bring the bloodhounds over to where he went missing and right away they pick up his scent and then somewhat paradoxically, instead of going down to the river where all the authorities assume that's where he must have gone, the dogs turned and went up this near sheer cliff. They went over 500 feet uphill to this clearing on the mountain, this little plateau on the mountain, and then they just laid down as if they had found him. The authorities assumed this was an anomaly. There's no way this child could have gotten up nearly 500 feet to that plateau, not to mention there was no sign of the child up there anyways. So they just assumed that the dogs must be wrong. So they sent those dogs back and got new bloodhounds to do the same test. And so they brought the new bloodhounds to the point where, where Alfred had vanished, and they did the same thing. They didn't go down to the river. They followed the exact same trail all the way up, nearly 500 feet up to that plateau where they, where they laid down to signify this is where the scent ends. And it was baffling because there was, there was nothing up there to indicate that he was there or ever was there. But now you have two groups of bloodhounds that did the same thing. You can't say his scent wasn't up there because the dogs found it twice. So at the same time this search is going on, a report came in from another hiker that was about six miles away, less than 24 hours after he had gone missing. And the report from this hiker was he was sitting down to take a rest and he looked up towards this mountain. And about 500 feet up, he saw a little rocky outcropping and a boy walked out to the edge and looked down at him. And the man looked up like, how did the boy get up there? And the child let out a shrill shrieking sound before something that was out of view pulled him backwards and then he was never seen again and so he reported it and the authorities dismissed it because how could a four-year-old boy have moved six miles away and 500 feet up to this rocky outcropping however authorities did send a team to go search that area where this hiker had seen this child and there was nothing there so you have these two separate locations one near where alfred disappeared about 500 feet up on a seemingly inaccessible rocky outcropping where the where the bloodhounds had, had taken a scent to and then it vanished and then six miles away you have another sighting of a boy that matches Alfred's description that's another 500 feet up on a rocky outcropping that's seemingly inaccessible to a child. And that's all we have. Alfred was never found. In August of 1897, two parents and their six-year-old daughter named Lillian went berry picking in Maine. The section of Maine they were in was only 15 miles away from the Canadian border, and it was very, very densely forested. At some point, the parents noticed that Lillian wasn't with them anymore. They assumed she must have wandered a couple feet away. Maybe she was behind a tree. But after an hour of searching, where they can't believe they're not seeing any trace of their daughter. I mean, they're in the middle of nowhere, where if you yell out, someone's going to hear you but there was no response from their daughter they can't find her anywhere so they alert authorities hundreds and hundreds of people came out for this search the family is distraught they're offering these huge rewards for any information about their daughter you have all these very experienced outdoorsmen and huntsmen that are going out and looking for this girl there is nothing she has vanished completely during this whole ordeal friends and family would stay out in the woods overnight they would just stay out there yelling and calling 
for Lillian and she never, she never turned up. About 48 hours after Lillian disappeared, there was a group of people searching an area about two to three miles away from where Lillian had gone missing. And Lillian just walks out from behind a tree, perfectly calm, doesn't look harmed, and she's just asking for her mother. There's this amazing reunion. It, it's a miracle that she's been found. I mean, this is two days that she's been missing in the middle of rural Northern Maine. I mean, anything could have happened to her, but she's here, she's alive. When they asked the girl, what happened? Where'd you go? Why did you walk away? Like, what happened? She said something that piqued David Politis' interest, and this is why this became a part of the Missing 411 project. She said, the sun shined all the time in the woods. The problem with that is while she was missing, it was overcast, dark, dreary, and she was in a very dense forest where there was, even if, even if it really had been a very sunny day, you're not getting much sunlight coming down to the forest floor. So why would she describe something as being sunny the whole time in the woods when in reality, there was almost no sunlight? She also claimed that over the two days she was missing, she heard people talking around where she was, but she said that she needed to stay quiet because of the tramps that would be upset if she made any sound. It's just a very strange story, and like every other missing 411 case, there really isn't a good rational explanation for why it happened. While David Politis does not come out and say explicitly what he believes is behind all these strange occurrences inside of these missing persons cases, the insinuation or, or implication of his research is that something paranormal is behind it. So I'd like to hear what you think is behind some of these strange disappearances. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, I would encourage you to gently mule kick the like button and subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three to four, even five video uploads on content that sounds an awful lot like what you just listened to in today's video. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. Also, I'm very active on TikTok, where my handle is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all of the above, I just really appreciate your support. Until next time, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will talk to you soon. There is a very famous mystery called the Dyatlov Pass incident that occurred in the 50s in Russia, where you had nine highly experienced hikers go out on an expedition and then not turn up at their rendezvous point. When a huge search party is launched and they're discovered, the circumstances under which they are found are truly baffling. I mean, you had people with clothes, some without. You had people that were mildly radioactive. You had people that were missing body parts. And none of it really fit the narrative that there had been an avalanche or that they had died of hypothermia. It was almost like something had attacked them, but we have no idea what it was. And so that mystery has endured for years, for decades. And so today's story is referred to as the American Dyatlov Pass incident because you have a group of people that go missing inexplicably and then are located under baffling conditions. And just like the original Dyatlov Pass, we know in today's story what happened to them for the most part. We just don't know why. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all I do here. And I upload three to four times a week, if not more. And so if that's something you're interested in, I would encourage you to gently karate chop the like button and then subscribe to this channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Today's story takes place in 1978, and it focuses on five young men that were best friends, basically inseparable, who all lived in Yuba City, California, and they came to be known as the Yuba City Five. These five young men were all either mildly intellectually disabled or had a mental health disability, but they were all very high functioning. Jack Hewitt was the youngest of the group. He was 24 years old. He was fairly uncomfortable in social situations and didn't do well around strangers, but around his four best friends, he blossomed and was incredibly funny and lighthearted and got along extremely well. Ted Wheeler was the oldest of the group. He was 32 and he kind of took a, a big brother approach to Jack Hewitt. He kind of looked after Jack specifically. Those two were very, very close. 
and Ted was known to actually occasionally make phone calls on Jack's behalf. When Jack felt uncomfortable calling a stranger on the phone, you know, Ted would step in and, and be the bigger brother and make those phone calls for him. Bill Sterling was 29 years old and he was deeply religious. He would spend a lot of his time going to the library where he would read Christian literature. Jack Madruga was 30 years old and he was an army veteran. However, he had been discharged from the army after a medical evaluation determined that his, his IQ was too low. So he was discharged from the army. He was the designated driver of the Yuba City Five because he was the only one of the five that had a driver's license. Jack loved being the driver because he loved his white and turquoise Montego, a 1969 Montego. It was like his prized possession and he felt very proud driving the group around. Last but not least, you have Gary Mathias, who was the unofficial ringleader of the group. He was 25 years old. He also was an army veteran, and he as well had been discharged following a medical evaluation where they diagnosed him with schizophrenia. So he was discharged and he went back home to Yuba City to move in with his parents. Initially, when he came home, he really struggled. They hadn't, they hadn't found a good way to manage his, his diagnosis. But eventually his doctor found the right mixture of medications and treatment and he, t he totally stabilized. And in fact was able to even hold down a job working part time with the stepfather in his gardening business. Now what really brought this group of five men together was their shared love of sports, really basketball specifically. When they got together, they were either talking about basketball, watching basketball or playing basketball. The gateway program that they were all enrolled in, the Voc Rehab program, they had a basketball team. And so they all played on that basketball team and they were super passionate about that team. In February of 1978, their basketball team, along with a host of others, were slated to compete in a tournament where the winners of this tournament would get a free trip out to Los Angeles. And so the Yuba City Five was so excited about this tournament. Their tournament was supposed to start on February 25th, 1978, but their favorite basketball team, UC Davis, was playing just 50 miles away from them in Chico, California, on February 24th, so the night before their big tournament. So they decide that they want to go watch this game, right? They want to go out to Chico and root on their favorite team, but make sure they're back in time so they can get a good night's sleep before their tournament starts on the 25th. So they load up in Madruga's Montego, they drive the 50 miles out to Chico, California, and they root on their team, UC Davis, who ends up winning the game. Now, there were multiple witnesses that saw the Yuba City Five at this basketball game, so we know they were there. Following the game, the boys loaded up into Madruga's Montego, and they drove a short distance to a little convenience store in Chico where they got sodas and cartons of milk and some snacks, and the shop owner would actually say to investigators that he remembers them because they came in at about 10 p.m. and it was when he wanted to close down the shop. And so he remembers feeling annoyed when this big group, you know, five men come in and they're buying a bunch of stuff because it delayed uh, the shop owner's ability to close down the store. That sighting at the convenience store would prove to be the last time anyone would see the boys alive. So that night, some of the boys' parents had stayed awake to wait for their son to come home. And when they didn't, and it was starting to get late, the parents started calling each other to ask if they had seen their son, and no one had. And so not only was it strange because the boys always told their parents and loved ones where they were gonna be, but the idea that they would jeopardize a good night's sleep before this tournament that they had been obsessing about just seemed very, very uncharacteristic. And so by very early the next morning, all the families called the police and said something is wrong. So the police officer in charge of the investigation was Lieutenant Lance Ayers. Ayers had gone to high school with Ted Weir. So he had a personal connection to this investigation and was more motivated than perhaps he would have been otherwise to make sure they are doing everything in their power to find these boys. When the first few hours of the search don't turn anything up, Lieutenant Ayers decides that he's gonna greatly expand their search radius. And it was because of this expanded search that just a few days later, they were able to locate Jack Madruga's Montego car. Presumably, after the boys had gotten their snacks and drinks at the convenience store around 10 p.m., they would have been driving straight back to Yuba City because they had that big basketball tournament the next morning. But the car was found 70 miles away from Yuba City, away from Chico, up in a remote forest on a dirt road. The families of the boys had no idea, they couldn't even speculate 
why that car would have driven up that access road into this remote forest. There was no reason they'd be going up there, at least none that the families would have any understanding of. In addition to the strangeness surrounding why it was 70 miles away up in some remote forest, it also didn't make any sense that the boys had abandoned the vehicle. Even though it was covered in snow, there was no indication that it had been stuck in snow. There was a quarter tank of gas, so it didn't run out of gas. There were no keys in the ignition, so when the police had to hotwire it to drive it back, the car ran just fine, so there was no mechanical issues or, or any engine issues. They literally put it in park, in the middle of nowhere and got out and left. They looked inside the vehicle and all that was in there was some wrappers and cans and cartons from the snacks that they had presumably been eating since they left that convenience store. But no keys, all the doors were shut, one window was down slightly, and some wrappers, that was it. So the search shifts to now looking exclusively in the area that this car was found. And over the first couple of days following the discovery of the car, they're looking everywhere and there's no sign of the boys. And then unfortunately, a massive snowstorm rolls in and basically covers everything to the point where it's impossible to search. And they had to abandon the search until the early spring when the snow had melted a bit. During this waiting period, the families of the boys put out rewards, were requesting information from everyone and anyone that had it. The police were fielding thousands of tips and unconfirmed sightings about where they could be, but none of it amounted to anything. They made no progress. They had no idea where these boys were. On June 4th, 1978, so just a little over three months after the boys had gone missing, some motorcyclists that had been on a long road trip happened to be up in those mountains on those dirt roads near where the Montego, the car, had been discovered. They were about 20 miles from that point and they had found this cul-de-sac that they parked their bikes in and they decided to just kind of stretch their legs and they look down a little ways off the cul-de-sac and they see this old looking trailer and they decide just out of curiosity to just kind of walk over and see what it is. It would turn out that it was a trailer maintained by the forestry service, but it really hadn't been upkept in a long time. And so as they're walking over, they see that one of the windows has been broken and they think, okay, it's more than likely abandoned and they think they're just gonna open the door, poke their head in and just see what's in there. Just purely out of curiosity because they're kind of in the middle of nowhere and they're just curious. So they go up and they open the door and they're immediately hit with this horrible, horrible smell. And they shut the door and they're like, I don't know what's in there. It smells like death. It would turn out that it was death. It was one of the Yuba City Five. It was Ted Weir, who was the oldest of the group, who looked after Jack, who was the youngest of the group. It was his body. The mystery really only deepens when you go inside the trailer. Ted Weir was found wrapped in eight blankets on this bed inside of this trailer. His feet were badly frostbitten and gangrenous. He looked like he had lost about 50% of his body weight and he had growth on his face, like his beard, that showed he'd been laying there almost certainly for about 13 weeks. Ted had died from a combination of starvation and from exposure to the elements. But in the trailer, in plain sight, were loads of fire making materials. You had paperback books, you had kindling, you had matches, you had firewood. In addition to the fire making material, there was additional clothing, heavy clothing, like for cold weather. There was lots of food, like sea rations, military sea rations, where you can basically pop it open and you have some food, enough to, to feed someone for at least a year. So there's food in plain sight, there's fire making supplies in plain sight, and also there was a propane tank out back that was basically full, that if they just turned it on, they could have turned on the heat inside of the trailer and then you would have you would have had heat for quite some time but there was no signs that any of these supplies were ever touched now one could potentially make the case that perhaps ted you know lacked the common sense to make a fire and to use up all the resources that were right in front of him but gary matthias his shoes were inside of that trailer and gary was in the army and i was in the military and i can tell you that the number one thing you're taught pretty much no matter where you go in the military is how to survive. You're taught to be resourceful and to use things in front of you to stay alive. And it just seems very strange that if you had Gary in there that he wouldn't have immediately started a fire or at least instructed the group to start a fire and eat the food, turn on the gas tank. Those are things that are just basic life-saving skills. A day after Weir's body is found inside of that trailer, searchers discover Sterling and Madruga's remains located approximately 11 miles 
from where the car had been located. Their remains showed signs of significant predation. Animals had gotten to their remains and so there wasn't much left of them. But from what was left, investigators were able to determine that both had passed away from hypothermia. Two days after Madruga and Sterling's remains are found, Jack Hewitt's remains are found as well, two miles from the trailer where Weir had been found and Jack Hewitt had also died of hypothermia. So four of the five have been located, leaving Gary Mathias, who to this day has never been found. The only thing that investigators discovered was about a quarter mile away from the trailer where Weir was found, they found a bunch of blankets and a flashlight. It seems like that could have been where Gary at one point had been, but they don't know for how long, and they don't know where he went after that. So in addition to wondering where Gary went, you've got to ask yourself, why did these five men drive 70 miles out of the way the day before they knew they had this big basketball tournament that they were not about to jeopardize? Why did they drive 70 miles away onto a remote dirt road in a remote forest? Why did they then suddenly park their car? turn it off, take the keys out, shut the doors, and then hike 20 miles in the dead of night in a snowstorm to some random trailer, and then get in the trailer where there's ample food, there's ample blankets and additional clothes, but use none of it and die over a 13 week period from starvation and exposure. Why? And so there's many theories as to why this happened, ranging from, you know, Gary Mathias is somehow responsible and that's why we haven't found him yet, to they simply took a wrong turn and that's how they wound up in this mountain in the middle of nowhere. But none of it really accounts for the purposefulness of all of their travel. If they had gotten lost, police believe they would have been maybe driving in loops. They wouldn't have just driven in a straight line reached this point in the road and then gotten out. It's not consistent with being lost. So we don't know why they wound up on that road or why they decided to go to that trailer or, or what caused them not to use the supplies, but something happened, something forced them to do this. And to this day, we don't know what it was. So I'd love to hear your theories as to why the Yuba City Five did what they did. Give me your best theory and I'll do my best to go through and respond to as many as I possibly can. If you like this story and you wanna hear more like it, I post stories like this three, four, five times a week. And if that's something you're interested in, I would encourage you to gently karate chop the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of those weekly uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can send me a direct message on Instagram where my handle is johnballin416. Also, I'm very active on TikTok where my handle is mrballin, just like my YouTube page. So wherever I see you, I just appreciate your support. It's really been a blast making these videos. And it just means the world to me that so many people are as interested in these stories as I am. So thank you all for your support. Thank you for watching to the end of this video. And until next time, I'll talk to you soon. When I was in college, I went on a cruise from Florida down to the Bahamas and then back. About halfway to the Bahamas, we hit some bad weather. The boat was rocking pretty aggressively to the point where we weren't allowed to go onto the upper decks of the ship. Chairs and tables were shifting around. The crew and the staff were unconcerned. This is something they've been through. They, they sail this route regularly. They know the ship is equipped to handle pretty rough weather. But as a passenger, it was really terrifying to just suddenly realize that despite the, the safety, the perceived safety of this huge multi-hundred million dollar ship, the reality is, is when you're out in the ocean, Mother Nature's gonna do whatever it's gonna do. Now, fortunately, the, the weather did subside and sure enough, the ship was fine and we sailed through it. But it always stuck with me that if you're out in the middle of the ocean and something goes bad, it goes really bad. The two stories I'm gonna share are about groups of people that were out on the open ocean and something went bad. Very, very bad. Before we get going on today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you have come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three to four, sometimes even five times every week. And if that's of interest to you, I would encourage you to gently arm bar the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of those weekly uploads. All right, let's get into the stories. In 
In the very early hours of May 26, 2013, three tugboats were towing this massive Chevron oil tanker in the Gulf of Guinea. They were about 32 kilometers off the coast of Nigeria. Two of the tugboats were pressed up against the sides of this huge tanker to provide stability as it gets towed. The third tugboat, which was called the Jascone 4, sat way out in front and had the main tow line strapped to the front of the tanker and was doing all of the actual towing. On board that lead tugboat, the Jascone 4, were 12 crew members who had all been hired by a company called West African Ventures. It was a Nigerian-based company. They owned the ship and they had contracted them to come out and be a part of this towing operation. One of the crew members was a man named Harrison O'Keen. He was from Nigeria and he was the ship's cook. At around 4.45 that morning, Harrison was in his quarters. He had been sleeping, but he had woken up because the ship was swaying pretty dramatically. It was very rough seas, but he, like the rest of the crew, were accustomed to rough, choppy water. So he gets up, he unlocks his bedroom door, and he goes out into the hall. When he looks down the hall, he sees that all of the other doors are shut and locked. The crew of the Jascone 4 had a policy that whenever they slept or were in their rooms, they would shut and lock the doors because piracy is a really big threat. After Harrison looked down the hall at all of these locked doors, he started making his way down the hall in the other direction towards the bathroom. He kind of stumbled down the hall as the ship rocked from the very rough seas. He gets to the bathroom and shuts the door at 4.50 in the morning. We know this because at 4.50 in the morning, a rogue wave hit the side of Jaskin 4 and almost completely flipped it upside down. Snapped the tow line, the ship is completely on its side and it's sinking very fast. He tried to push open the metal bathroom door, but already a surge of water is coming down the hall and pressing him into the bathroom. Pushes against that surge of water and gets the door open and now he's standing on the ceiling of the hallway that he was just in a moment ago because the boat is now completely inverted. And he's looking down the hall. Three of the crew members have managed to come out of their locked rooms and in a panic are trying to make their way up to the exit. He sees them as another surge of water blasts in through one of the windows and literally sweeps them away. And he knows they're dead. The power cuts out right as another surge of water is coming down the hall to him. He turns his body in this rush of seawater, this freezing seawater comes pouring down the hall and it takes Harrison and throws him down this little hall way and slams him into yet another bathroom. It was actually an officer's bathroom. It was connected to an officer's room. And so now he's inside of this other bathroom and he's kind of like clamoring naturally, instinctively to go up to try to get to air because that's what anyone would do if you're underwater in a panic. And as he's swimming up, he couldn't believe it when he gets to air. He, his head clears the surface in the bathroom and he's, he's in an air pocket, but it's pitch black, all the power is out. The ship is rapidly sinking. The water is freezing. Harrison has only got his boxer shorts on. He doesn't have a light source. He doesn't have food. He doesn't have water. And he has this couple cubic feet of air that any moment he's waiting for it to collapse. He knows these are his final moments. And he remembers a prayer that his wife had texted him before he started this particular job and he started reciting the prayer in his head as he waited to die. The ship slams into the ocean floor but the air pocket doesn't collapse. So Harrison is in this tiny little air pocket 30 meters below the ocean surface. At this point even though Harrison has no idea how he just survived the shipwreck he now has to deal with the fact that he's eventually going to run out of air. He'll die of dehydration. He'll die of exposure. He's in freezing water up to his neck. And most terrifyingly, sharks and other animals are going to start converging on the ship to look for food. And he is in a bathroom that, although there's the air pocket, the door is open into the main hall and his entire body is inside of this bathroom. Meaning if a, if a shark were in the hallway swimming down the inside of this hall and it made it to the bathroom, he's completely exposed with no way to shut the door. It was wedged open. So his lower half is, is completely exposed to whatever wildlife is inside of this ship. So he literally is just waiting to die. He just doesn't know how he's going to die. After sitting there for quite a while, he started to feel very cold and he knew that if he didn't find a way to get his body a little bit higher into the air pocket, basically get his upper body out of the water, that he was certainly going to die soon just from hypothermia. Even though he knew he was doomed, his will to live 
was just, it was bubbling through. He did not want to die yet. And as he's sitting there thinking, how is he gonna get himself up into this air pocket? Cause he had nothing he could step on or kind of stand on. He realized that right next to him, there was the officer's room. This was the officer's bathroom and the door was open. He could, if he wanted to, he could dive down and swim through the door and go into the officer's bedroom and look for supplies. And in his mind, he thought he could probably pull off some of the paneling because it's gonna be pitch black in there if you just swam straight to the far side of the room, he could get to some of the, the fake wood paneling or whatever it was and he could yank it down. And as he's building up his courage to dive into pitch black water, he starts hearing this horrible sound of large sea creatures smashing into the boat. They were basically looking for entrance points into the boat. And then they would come into the boat, sharks, and he could hear them bumping up against the insides of the ship. And all he's thinking is, I'm completely exposed. I'm doomed. I gotta go. I gotta go in there. I gotta at least make an attempt to save myself. And so listening to sharks and other animals searching for things to eat, he takes a deep breath and in total darkness, he dives down and swims into the officer's bedroom. And as he's swimming, because he's just going straight across to the far wall to start yanking off that paneling, he's bumping into things that he believes are bodies. He doesn't know, but he thinks they are. He gets to the far wall and he yanks off a piece of paneling. He swims back. One successful trip. He goes back down and he makes a number of trips until he's able to fashion that little raft he had in mind, like a little step stool that pushed him up into the air pocket to where half of his upper body was now out of the freezing water. Also, while he was in the officer's room, even though it was pitch black, he was kind of like feeling around for things and he wound up finding a bottle of soda and a flashlight. So he turns on his flashlight and he drinks his soda and he just takes a breath. Even though he's still in the same terrible situation, he's thankful for that little victory. About 24 hours would go by where he has this light on and he's nursing the soda. He knows he's either gonna die from sharks, hypothermia, dehydration, something's going to kill him. But part of him is thinking, maybe if a dive team is able to locate the ship, they're gonna come down to retrieve bodies. And maybe they'll find me, maybe I can hold out that long. And so as he's, as he's thinking about this, he's, he's getting a little flicker of hope, two horrible things happen. His light goes out, flashlight doesn't work, at the same time that he describes hearing the large sea creatures make their way into the officer's room right next to him. So I want you to think about this. You're at the bottom of the ocean. You're in a ship that has sunk. You're in a little air pocket. You really don't have any supplies to last longer than a few days. It's total darkness. You had your flashlight, it's gone out. It's totally dark. A shark that has been eating your friends, or more than one shark, is now literally feet away from you. And you can hear it eating the bodies that apparently are in there. You are exposed to them because there's an entrance to that room and there's an entrance to the hall. The fear must have been indescribable. For the next 36 hours, Harrison sat there listening to a shark slam into the wall, but never attack him. He heard sharks in the main section of the ship bumping around, waiting at any moment that if the ship were to just tilt a little bit, his air pocket's gonna collapse. It's unfathomable how terrible those 36 hours must have been. At the 60 hour mark, he hears what sounds like something metal banging on the outside of the ship. He notices through the, through the hallway, because he has a bit of a vantage point through the water down the hall in front of him, he sees a flicker of light. And there's no light down here, so it really stood out. Without even thinking about it, he takes a deep breath and swims right into the hallway, the one place he had not been since he had gone into the bathroom, because there are sharks. And he starts swimming farther and farther and farther away from his air pocket, and he's running out of air. He can't find the light. He doesn't even know if he saw a light. He thinks he might be hallucinating, and he's realizing, I'm almost out of air. You know, he's looking around, and he decides, I gotta go back to my air pocket. And he turns around, he's trying to swim back. He's looking for his bathroom. He's swimming as fast as he can. He's about to run out of air and he makes it to his air pocket and his head goes up and he takes a big breath. And he's not sure if he really actually saw the light or not. And he's thinking, that was it. I thought I was gonna be rescued, but I was just imagining it. And then a miracle. It was a diver. 
and the diver had come back. The diver was part of a crew that had been sent down to recover bodies. No one lives for three days underwater. So the diver comes down his way and Harrison knew that he was going to scare the daylights out of this diver. And so he gently touched him on the back and the diver reacts really violently because he's expecting it to be an animal of some kind. And Harrison reaches out and just grabs the diver's hand and squeezes it gently and shows him his hand. And the diver's got a big light on his head, pokes his head up into this air pocket. You see this man that for the past 36 hours has been in total darkness with absolutely no way out. He was done for. And the look on Harrison's face is just, it's priceless. They fitted Harrison with a dive mask and they brought him up. He did not immediately go to the surface because he had been at depth for so long, he had to go through something called decompression. If he had just breathed air at normal pressure, he would have died. So they put him in a decompression chamber for 60 hours before actually bringing him to the surface. And so ultimately Harrison was okay, but the trauma of this experience was so extreme that to this day, Harrison's wife says that basically every night he wakes up thinking he's on a sinking ship. In October of 1982, Deborah Kiley and her four friends were hired by a billionaire to take his brand new luxury 18 meter yacht called the Trash Man from Maine all the way down to Florida. A pretty significant journey along the east coast of the United States. Deborah and her friends were very experienced sailors. They had done trips like this before, driving these luxury yachts around. This was just gonna be a great trip. The weather was beautiful. The forecast looked perfect and they were off. Two days into their journey when they were off the coast of North Carolina, a freak storm came out of nowhere and all of a sudden their ship is in this massive, massive storm. And despite their best efforts to keep water from coming in, eventually the ship begins to sink. And so as the ship is clearly sinking, the crew has to abandon it and they jump into the violently surging sea and they climb aboard this little tiny life raft with no food, no water, no life-saving equipment. And Meg, who was one of her friends, one of Deborah's friends, had cut open her leg really badly when the ship was initially sinking. Something had fell and cut her leg. So she's bleeding into the water. As they clambered into this dinghy, Deborah remembers something nudging one of her legs and looking out and not just seeing one or two sharks, but she described seeing hundreds of sharks. 18 foot long tiger sharks who will eat almost anything including people, had detected Meg's bleeding leg when she was holding on to the dinghy before she climbed in. They had all swarmed the area and they start feeling bumps underneath their raft as the tiger sharks are swimming up and ramming into them. The storm ultimately passed and daylight broke and they're out in this dinghy. They don't know what to do. They're surrounded by all these sharks that are literally swimming around them. They have no resources, they have nothing. They have no way to save themselves. Meg was becoming very sick from the wound in her leg and everyone knew that probably they were gonna die out here. So desperately thirsty were some of the crew members that they began leaning over and drinking seawater until they would vomit. And it was around this time when they were drinking seawater on the third day that some of the hallucinations began. They all would, would see ships in the distance and they would hear things that weren't really there. They were losing it. And it was also around this time that John, one of the crew members, said that he saw land and he leapt out of the boat. They screamed for him to come back, but he lost his mind. And they said he only made it about a few meters away from the boat before they hear him start screaming and the sharks swarm him and pull him under the water. Deborah would say that when this happened, they heard the scream and they all ducked down inside of the boat. Didn't say a word, didn't even react to it. They knew what was happening and they knew what was gonna happen to them. They were all going to die out here. Shortly after John had jumped in the water and been eaten by sharks, Mark stands up and says that he needs to get something at the store. He was clearly hallucinating. The other three, they tell him, you're hallucinating, get back here, sit back down. He wasn't having it and he stepped off the boat. Immediately, just like John, the sharks swarm him, except they pull him underneath their life raft. In fact, Deborah would say that the violence of the sharks attacking him caused their dinghy to spin. And much like when John had been attacked, they all just laid there in silence because they knew that they were all doomed. By the fourth day, everybody was on a steady decline. They didn't have any water, any food. Meg especially 
was outright dying. I mean, she had this horrible wound that had gone untreated. And at some point, Deborah and the other crew member who was not hurt, his name was Brad, they fell asleep. And when they woke up, Meg had passed away from her infection. They took off her jewelry and any of her valuables they could give to her family. And then they put her on the edge of the boat. They said a couple words, a little funeral for her, and then they pushed her into the water. And then they laid down inside of the raft as the sharks attacked. At this point, Deborah and Brad, the last two, they, they are laying in this lifeboat, fully exposed to the elements. They have no way to save themselves. And at some point they fell asleep and they probably thought they wouldn't wake up again. But they woke up on the fifth day and Brad looks out and thinks he sees a ship. And so he looks down and looks back up to make sure he's not hallucinating and he still sees the ship. He looks down again and looks back up and it's still a ship and it's, come, it's coming closer to them. And he tells Deborah, hey, there's a ship. I'm not imagining it, there's a ship. And she does the same thing. She kind of looks, looks away, like, is that really a ship? And sure enough, it was. And they start waving and using all their energy to try to get this ship to see them. And the ship has clearly seen them. They're waving back. That ship would end up coming over, scooping up Deborah and Brad, getting them to a hospital, and they would make full recoveries. Deborah would go on to be an incredible motivational speaker, as you can imagine, uh, with an experience like that. And she also wrote a book about her experience being lost at sea. Brad would actually continue to go back to sea. He was an accomplished mariner. He would end up uh, becoming the captain of his own ship and he would regularly sail that route that they crashed on. It's hard to imagine Harrison Deborah and Brad going back to a normal life, but ultimately they did. You know, they had this incredible experience. I'm sure it was incredibly traumatic, but I'm sure it gave them a, a new sense of purpose in the life that they were now being gifted because they really should not have been alive. Deborah would actually say in one of her keynotes that there's never a day you feel more thankful for life than the day you almost die. If you enjoyed today's stories, I would ask you to please kindly armbar the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three to four video uploads that sound an awful lot like what you just listened to. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. I'm also very active on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin. Wherever I see you, I'm just incredibly thankful for your support. And until next time, see ya. There is a house in Gary, Indiana that has been dubbed the Demon House. Now, if you were to walk past this house on the street, it wouldn't stand out to you. It's very modest, single story, three bedroom home, looks like all the other houses around it. But the history behind this house is totally bizarre. Latoya Ammons, who was a mother of three that lived inside of this house with her three kids, she began to report to the police that demons were throwing her children against the wall. Now, when police got the report that children are being thrown against the wall, their first thought is, you're an unfit parent. And so they sent Child Protective Services and the police to go check out this residence and make sure that she really was a competent parent. They are shocked at what they find. And what they find is documented in a police report. And courtesy of the executive producer of 317 Films, Christopher Geizot, I have a copy of said police report. And when I read through this thing for the first time, I literally wrote him an email and said, this is fake. There's no way this is an actual police report. And he said, no, that's real. It's from the Lake County Sheriff's Department. It is the official police report. And it's just, it's mind blowing. Today, I'm gonna tell the story of what happened when the police got involved, and I'm just going to use information that was in the police report. But before we get into today's crazy story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do, and I upload three to four, even five times every week. And so if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to gently take the like button out for a nice seafood dinner and never call it again. That's so weird. <laughs> and also sub to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into the story. After numerous reports that Latoya Ammons was mistreating her children based on reports that she gave, she was telling police that demons were throwing her kids around the house. Based on those reports, 
Child Protective Services was sent to do a home study to go to their house, go to Latoya Ammon's house and make sure it was a safe, clean place for children to be living. In addition to the case manager, her name was Valerie Washington, who was gonna be going over to do this home study, the Lake County Sheriff Department also sent over Lieutenant Gruska, who would be assisting Valerie and watching the home study take place. When Gruska arrives at the house, he is met with Valerie Washington, also Latoya Ammons, the mother, and her two sons, Andrew, who's nine, and Amante, who's seven, as well as Latoya's mother, so the boy's grandmother. Her name was Rosa. Washington, the case manager, pulls Gruska aside out of earshot of Latoya and her family, and she starts telling Gruska about what happened at the hospital eight days earlier, because she, the case manager had already begun investigating Latoya Ammons and that whole situation with her kids. Eight days earlier, Washington was at the hospital sitting in a waiting room. Washington was with a psychologist and they were speaking to Rosa, who was the grandmother of these children. In the room was also Andrew, the oldest son, and Amante, the youngest son. And as they're chatting, Amante, the youngest son, stands up and walks to the middle of the waiting room. And his eyes roll back into his skull, and he begins emitting this growling sound that sounded too deep for a boy of seven years old. The grandmother reacted to it like she had seen it before. She got right up, she marched over to him, and she took him by the hands, and she yelled, You are not you. And she kept saying that, and the boy's eyes are still back in his head, and he's not responding to anything his grandmother's saying. As Rosa is repeating over and over again, you are not you, Amante begins backpedaling towards a wall behind him. And Rosa holds his hands the whole time. She's holding his hands firmly. He gets to the wall, and instead of stopping, he puts his foot up against the wall. This is a seven-year-old boy. And begins walking up the wall by pressing against Rosa. And she's holding on tight and he's pressing back at her and using that weight to walk backwards up the wall. The psychologist in Washington are just watching in disbelief. Rosa's holding on to him as he walks all the way up to where he's on his tippy toes on the wall. And then he flips forward in front of her and lands on his feet on the other side of Rosa. The psychologist and Washington literally run out of the room and they go get a doctor and they explain what happened. The doctor comes in, not having any clue what to make of this, and just says to the boy, can you do that again? And Amante, at this point, his eyes are back to normal, and he's sitting now next to Rosa, and he says, what? I didn't do anything, and acted like he had not been walking up the walls. Now, it's not in the report how Lieutenant Gruska responds to Washington's story about the hospital. However, the entire police report that I'm pulling all this information from is written by Lieutenant Gruska at the end of the investigation. So this exchange between he and the case manager, Washington, about the hospital visit that he was not part of, it apparently carried weight in the entire investigation that he felt compelled to add it into the report. Even though on paper, you would think if you're doing a home study for this house, why would you incorporate something that didn't have anything to do with the house? It gives you maybe an insight into Lieutenant Gruska, although his language remains super professional and very pragmatic, that perhaps Lieutenant Gruska at the end of this investigation was starting to think this might be paranormal. After this story, two more police officers show up to the house to assist with this home study. One was Brian Miller and the other was Charles Austin. At this point, the three officers, Gruska, Miller, and Austin, along with the case manager, Washington, begin walking towards the family and towards the front door of the house. Latoya says that she and her kids will not go back in the house because they had moved out very recently because of the strangeness that they claim was happening inside of the house. They felt like they were under attack by demons. And so the police, they needed someone to bring them in. And so Rosa, the grandmother, Latoya's mother, she offered to go in with them. So the house is a single story, three bedroom house. You walk in and you're inside of the screened in porch. You go into the main level. There's a few bedrooms and then there's a stairwell that leads down into the basement. And so they go in and Lieutenant Gruska is in charge of taking pictures and recording audio the whole time they're in the house. They were not aware that they had already moved out. So it's a bit of an awkward home study because they're not even living there anymore. But either way, they're gonna do their job. They're walking around, taking pictures of each of the bedrooms. There's three bedrooms, there's a kitchen, basic stuff upstairs. And then they go downstairs to the basement. Now, the basement 
was where Latoya and her family claimed the majority of the paranormal activity was taking place. The steps leading down to the basement were wood. They went down into the basement. The basement floor was concrete and the walls were concrete blocks. As they go down, Lieutenant Gruzka would notice that there were candles that had been placed all over the basement floor that had burned down to their wick. There was also an altar and a nativity scene that had been placed near the underside of the stairs. And so when Gruzka goes over to take pictures of the altar and the nativity scene, he recognizes that under the stairs, near where those two things are placed, it's all dirt. The concrete that made up the floor of the basement had been broken away, and there was jagged pieces of concrete where there should have been a continuous flow of concrete underneath the steps. It had been snapped up and broken away. It was gone. When Rosa was questioned about the strangeness of the basement with all the candles and the altar, she just said that there is a presence down here, and that's all she was able to articulate. The other officers and the case manager and Rosa, they go back upstairs, and Lieutenant Gruzka and Charles Austin, the other officer, they stay in the basement and take a few extra pictures, a couple more underneath the stairs and just of the candles before they ultimately go upstairs as well. When Gruzka comes upstairs, Rose is waiting for him and she's about to turn the light off leading down into the basement. And she asks him, did you get any pictures underneath the stairs? And he said, yeah, yeah, I did. I stayed down there and I took some more pictures. She looks at him and she says, sometimes at night when we're sleeping on the main floor, we'll hear commotion in the basement. It sounds like maybe someone bumping on the underside of the stairs. And then you hear footsteps walking up the wood steps and whatever it is stops on the other side of the door leading into the main floor and it will stay there for hours. We're too scared to open the door to look. Gruska goes back to his office and he immediately uploads the pictures that he took with a focus on the ones he took in the basement. And he finds that there is a couple pictures he took under the stairs that in the right hand corner of the picture, just behind one of the steps, it's partially obscured, is a white mist or a white cloud. And he zooms in on it and he brings in other officers and they look at it. And if you zoom in close enough, it looks like a man's face. As they're zoomed in on this mist underneath the stairs, they can see only because they've zoomed in that there appears to be a faint green mist on the left side of the picture. It appears to be a woman's face. Gruzka and Austin, who were the only two in the basement at the time of these pictures taken, swear they did not see a white or green mist under the stairs when they took pictures. Gruzka, again, it doesn't say in the report how he's feeling, but you can imagine he's starting to feel a little bit uneasy about what he's witnessing. Gruska just goes to his audio recording. And so he fast forwards to the section where he and Austin are alone in the basement taking these additional photos. And you can clearly hear on the recording, Gruska and Austin talking to each other as they're taking these pictures. And at some point as they're taking these pictures of the basement, a third voice, not Austin, not Gruska, say directly into the audio recorder, Hey! The audio recorder was one that Gruzka was used to using and it had never malfunctioned before. And he and Austin were the only ones down there. And so they couldn't explain where the third voice was coming from and neither could any of the other officers who listened to it. On April 30th, Gruzka set up a meeting with Latoya Ammon's priest, who she was very close with. They were regular churchgoers. This priest, his name was Father Maginot, he had been at the Ammon's residence five days before this home visit was done, when Latoya Ammons and her family was still living in that residence. And so Gruska went to interview him to get a sense of what it was like when they were still living there. Father Maginot said he was there because Latoya had reached out and said, I don't know what to do because she's claiming there are demons here. And while they're sitting in the living room on the main floor, Father Maginot is telling Gruska that the bathroom light started flickering on and off. And so it was distracting enough that ultimately Father Maginot got up and walked over to the bathroom. And as soon as he went inside, the flickering stopped. And then he'd go back down and sit down and it would start again. Repeatedly, Father Maginot would get up when it was flickering. He would go in and it would stop. He'd come back and it would start flickering again. So while this is happening and Father Maginot is going back and forth to the bathroom, trying to figure out why the light is flickering, Latoya points out that a liquid is forming on one of the window blinds in the room that they were all sitting in. There was this oily liquid substance that was just kind of trickling down the window blinds. And Father Maginot walks over and looks at it. They're all looking at it and there's no leak in the ceiling. There's no 
source for this liquid and it hadn't been there before. At least that's what Latoya Ammons and her family is saying, that that's not from us. We don't know what that is. As they're looking at this oily substance on the blinds, the cord that controls the blind itself starts swaying back and forth. And everyone's startled as they're looking at it because there's no draft in the room. The window's not open. There's no reason it should be swaying. While they're looking at this cord, Father Maginot looks down and sees this huge footprint in the carpet near where they're standing that was too big to be his, and nobody else in the house had a footprint that was that big. At this point, Father Maginot doesn't think it's safe for the family to be there and advises her to leave. And this would actually be the episode that prompts Latoya Ammons and her family to leave the house and not come back. On May 10th, Lieutenant Gruska, a new Child Protective Services case manager and a host of police officers go back to the Ammons residence. The Ammons residence has been unoccupied with all utilities shut off, locked and sealed since the last time they were there, which was on April 27th. So it's a two week period that no one has been in the house, but there was a customary follow-up to this house. They had to as part of the home study. When Lieutenant Gruska arrives at the property, outside is Father Maginot, as well as Latoya Ammons, her mother, Rosa, Latoya's two sons, Andrew and Amante, as well as a host of police officers. There's a canine unit that's there. Although it's not said explicitly in the report, it would appear that the reason there's all this additional police presence in a canine unit is because there's enough weirdness being reported about the house. There could be you know, a home invasion situation happening, that somebody else is living in this house. Any number of things could be happening, but they can't write off all of the strange testimony about what's happening in the house. And so before they go in for this second home study, they have one of the dogs from the canine unit go into the property and search the property for intruders, just in case this was a home invasion or something like that. They wanted to just check the box. So they send the dog in, the dog comes out, hasn't found anything unusual. And so the police, along with Father Maginot, the case manager, and Rosa, they go back into the house. The main level looked untouched. There was nothing strange happening in the main level when they walked around, nothing was disturbed. It looked like no one had been here in two weeks. So they open the door to the basement, they turn on the light, and a couple weird things happen right away. One, they notice that on the steps, on the wooden steps leading into the basement, there is an oily substance with no clear origin that goes all the way down the steps, snakes around the side and disappears underneath the stairs. As they begin walking down the stairs, the case manager from Child Protective Services happens to touch a cabinet that had been built into the walls along the stairwell leading down into the basement. And immediately she pulls her hand back. She grabs her pinky and she reacts like something had hurt her. And they ask, hey, what's going on? And she's like, I don't know, I just touched the cabinet and, and my hand now hurts, my pinky hurts, it's tingling. And it apparently had turned white. We don't have any images to show that, but her, her pinky basically had been wounded just from touching this cabinet. And so the officers go down into the basement, they follow this oily trail that goes back under the stairs. And they're thinking to themselves, all the utilities have been turned off. There's no reason there should be any water down here. Not to mention there's no origin for this oily substance and no one's been in the house for the past two weeks. So we can't even account for this by saying that one of the family members might have spilled something. And so even though it's not written into the report that they were scared or that they were considering this could be beyond rational explanation, it's clear from what happens next that everybody there was ready to explore the idea that something was happening underneath the steps. Because now the family's claimed there's been something crawling out of there and walking up the stairs at night. You have the strange oily substance coming from the underside of the stairs. You have the, the white and the green apparition inside of the pictures. Father Magino suggested that if there was a, some sort of demonic possession happening in the house, that there's a good chance they would find things underneath the steps that were tied to the family. And so they decide they're gonna dig up the dirt underneath the steps. And so Gruska begins digging into this, this dirt patch under the steps. And he makes it about two feet down and he finds a press on pink fingernail. He also finds women's underwear. And as he keeps digging, he finds a political pin, like for your t-shirt. He also finds the lid to one of the cooking pots from upstairs. He continues to dig and he finds some trash and miscellaneous papers. And it dawns on the group that someone or something is leaving the basement, going into the main section of the house, 
taking things from the family, going back downstairs, going underneath the steps, and burying them, and probably has been for some time. And so at some point, they stopped being able to dig any farther. The soil was too hard, so they put the soil back and decide to leave the house. As they're leaving the house, Rosa is the last one to leave, and she actually says, hey, come over here. And she's standing in that screened-in porch, and she's looking up at the, the window blinds. On the window blinds in the house is that same, or it appeared to be the same oily substance trickling down the blinds that matched the description of what Father Maginot had said he had seen when he was visiting the family before and saw liquid coming down the blinds. And so the officers reacted to this by saying, Rosa, did you do this? Are you responsible for putting this liquid on the blinds? And she said, no, there was no clear source for this liquid. There was no leak, there was nothing. And so Lieutenant Ruska wipes the liquid off of the blinds and tells everyone to leave the house. For 25 minutes, they waited. And then they went back inside to see if there was gonna be liquid there, and there was. And Father Maginot would say that after that first time he was there and he saw the liquid dripping down, he did some research. And it's very common over the history of time that if there's any sort of demonic possession in a house, that liquids will ooze from different areas in the house. And it's this oily substance that matches the description of what they just saw. At this point, Lieutenant Gruska and the police tell everyone to vacate the premise. They lock it up and they leave. And that is the end of the police report. Although not included in this police report where I pulled all of the story from, Charles Austin, who was the other officer, who was in the basement with Lieutenant Gruska when they were taking pictures underneath the steps and they heard that voice on the recorder, well, Charles Austin actually worked for another police department, the Hammond Police Department, and he took some pictures of the outside of this house during the time that no one was staying at the house. And one of the official police pictures shows a shadowy figure standing in the screened-in porch of this house right near where that liquid was dripping down the blinds. In 2014, Zach Bagans, who's a popular paranormal investigator, he hosts the show Ghost Adventures, he purchased the Demon House and filmed a documentary that he called The Demon House. And you can check that out for yourself. And he demolished the house in 2016. So I'd love to get your opinion on this story because I told it based on information that was available in official police documentation. Now, that doesn't mean that it was paranormal, that this house was haunted, that there were demons there but it at least makes you wonder what was really happening in that house. If you enjoyed this story, then please, if you would, kindly take the like button out for a nice seafood dinner and then never call it again, and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three to four, even five video uploads that sound an awful lot like what you just heard. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. I'm also very active on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube, or some combination of those, I'm just very thankful for your support. And until next time, see you guys.